It's easy to be distracted. It's easy to be focused on things other than that. And the thing about worship is that worship should guide us into a focus and a lifting up of Christ in our own eyes, personally. And I know I'm, I'm tempted and drawn away just like the rest of us. I mean, if I have to say this, if you're, if you're focusing on the piano player, you're probably not worshiping. If you're focusing on the guitar and the singers and the drums, you're not worshiping. I even think of earlier in our service when we lost the, the, the slides and we had the books. Focusing on the book, you're not worshiping. Worship is when you're focusing on the Lord. Worship is when you're focusing on the Lord. Mm. There's something powerful about praise and worship, and I... I have a hard time understanding why we want to run from it so much. Can we be honest? Like, the older I get, the more I'm like ready to go home. Can I get a good amen? Like, the older you get, the older you get, it's just, I'm ready to go home. It's like, this is great. I'm glad we're here. This is fun. Like, you could be going to a movie. You could be going to church service. You could be going to a friend's house. You could be going to a party, a celebration. You could be at the mall, at the store, wherever it is. You could be at your favorite thing. And part of me, at least me, still part of me is like, yeah, this is great, but let's, let's wrap this up and just go home. I'm ready to be home. And I know, I know that... My earthly home isn't really where my soul and my spirit are longing to be. Now we've strived, my wife is amazing and wonderful in the way she has worked so hard to make our physical home a restful and peaceful place. And we had this discussion and she said, listen, when I'm at work, when we're doing this, we have all kinds of problems, all kinds of worry, all kinds of anxiousness. We work with people that we have struggles and trials. When I get home, I want peace. We've talked about this a lot, that if any place in the world is going to be peaceful, it's going to be our home. It's something we strive for in our family. And I don't think that we came up with that. That's a borrowed idea. The peace, the true peace and rest and joy that we are looking for is in the presence of our Heavenly Father in our home before his throne in heaven. The scriptures say that Jesus is preparing a place for us. The scriptures say that there is joy forevermore in the presence of the Lord. There is peace in his presence There's something powerful about being in the presence of the mighty one. Something awesome, something that we should not forget, something that we should always remember. I think every day when we wake up, whether it is that you work the first, second, or third shift, you might wake up at night, but that when you wake up, you realize that the light that hits your eyes is a grace from God. Some of us are waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning. The sun has risen. It's rising, depending on the time of year. And you see the light of the sun. If you wake up to a new day, that day, whether it's, doesn't matter the time, doesn't matter the hour, you've woken up to a new day that the Lord has given you. And he promises you that I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That we can experience today, even today, the presence and the power of the Lord God Almighty in our lives. This is what the gift of the Holy Spirit is all about. The gift of God's presence with us. And Pentecost has always been, in the church, has always been somehow related to the events of the day of Pentecost in the early church. And the presence and the Holy Spirit of God coming down upon the church. And there is... Too much in this chapter to go over in one sermon. I'm going to read a passage of it to give us some context, and I'm going to preach the first four verses. And I might not get past the first verse, and that's okay. God's word is that awesome, I think, I think. Uh, so 
be uh, prayerful and mindful and, and listen to these words as I read them. I'm going to do my best not to read them as though they're a homework assignment, but to convey that this is a happening. This is a story of what actually happened with the early church. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances, utterance. Excuse me. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. But Peter, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and hear, heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Oh, I want to talk about that, but I won't. Um, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Some pronounce it Joel. I like to say Joel. L being the name of God. <clears throat> Joel, and he shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision, your old visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. This is God's word. 
And may the Lord God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Will you pray with me once more? Father God, enlighten our eyes that we might see your word, that we might hear it, of what it is that you say. Speak to me through your Holy Spirit and speak to your people through your Holy Spirit. Guide us into truth. I pray, Lord, that you would bring to my remembrance everything that you've said to me. Help me to remember your kind word, your gracious word, your powerful word, that I might share it with your people. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Just as I did a series through the 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'm going to do a series on the day of Pentecost. Because this chapter is so long and so full and so many things are mentioned in it, I feel it necessary that the church be reminded of what we've been told about that day and how we should live our lives and how we should trust in God to do a mighty work amongst us. Now, the details aren't going to be the same as it was with them. God's doing a work. He's doing a strange work and he's doing a new work. But I know that there are patterns that we can see so we can recognize when God is moving, moving amongst us. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they are all with one accord in one place. The word Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. The word Pentecost means 50 or 50th day. Penta being the word for five, Pentecost being 50. We have whole denominations and churches that call themselves Pentecostal churches. No problem with them, brothers. They're saved brothers going to, going to heaven just like me and you. You know, I don't worry about denominational names. I don't worry about that thing. But it is interesting, interesting to me that we have Pentecostal churches, which we have 50th day churches. Pentecost, the word Pentecost is often referring to the spirit being poured out and, and the fire coming from heaven that is contained within that day. The events of that day. But the word itself is just a number. Why is that so significant, though? Why Pentecost? Why the 50th day? We're talking 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. But here's the thing. It's not first uh, 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 pertaining to the resurrection of Christ. It actually goes further back than that. In the book of Exodus, I'm not going to turn there. There's a lot of notes. But if you're taking notes, I'm telling you Exodus chapter 12, that on the 14th day of the first month, God commands the children of Israel to take an innocent lamb of the first year and to slay that lamb and to place its blood on the doorposts and the lintel of all the houses of Israel. Each house is to have a lamb. Each house is to personally receive a lamb and slay that lamb for their own sins, for their own protection. And the death angel that night passed over the houses when, it, when the death angel saw the blood of the lamb Death passed over. And therefore, we have the, the Passover celebration. And the children of Israel were released from their bondage to Egypt as slaves, and they went out from Egypt on the Passover, which was the 14th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar. What does this have to do with Pentecost? Well, keep going with me. You'll find in Exodus chapter 19 that when they get to Mount Sinai, it says, the day, the self-same day, the King James says, the self-same day that they arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai and began to make camp. It was the first day of the third month. Now, if you're familiar with the Hebrew calendar, the first month has 30 days, the second month has 29. And then on the first day, so from the 14th day of Passover, 14th day of the first month, there's 14 days. You got 30, so there's 16. I know you didn't want to do math this morning. 16 plus another 29, that's 45. 45 days. Then the day that they pitch camp is day number 46. The next morning, Moses goes up the mountain, the scriptures tell us, and he meets with God. And God says, today and tomorrow, sanctify yourselves. And on the third day, I will come down. Day 49. From the Passover, counting 49 days, the presence of God descends on Mount Sinai. And what does the scripture say? It's a fire that descends on the mountain. This is the picture that we see. And it's interesting. In the upper room, 
The idea of the upper room. They were in a high place, just as the children of Israel were on a mountain. The presence of God fell. And what did God do? The book of Exodus teaches us that while Moses was up on that mountain in the presence of God, within the fire and the smoke and the cloud, God gave him the law. And he wrote it on tablets of stone. And we see here on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that the disciples of Christ, that the fire of God came and rested on each one of them. And instead of on a stony mountain of fire falling, you have one guy, his name is Peter, which means a stone. Fire falls on him and he begins to preach the word. And the scripture is fulfilled from the prophecy of Ezekiel. Ezekiel says, a new covenant I will establish with you. And I will write my law on your hearts and I will put my spirit within you. This is a fulfillment of those prophecies. No longer is God afar up, off on some high mountain coming down in his presence, but his very presence comes down on the people themselves. Pentecost is a loaded word. You might be familiar that this weekend is actually Pentecost. Today is the day of Pentecost according to our Gentile calendars, but on the Hebrew calendar, we are in the Feast of Shavuot, which you count seven sevens from the Passover. Israel was commanded to count seven weeks, and it's called the Festival of Weeks. Well, what is a week? Seven days. Seven times seven, 49. So from the Feast of Passover, you count 49 days, and on the 50th day, Pentecost, Shavuot, you have a celebration, it's the Feast of Weeks, and it's the celebration of the grain harvest. The early summer grain harvest begins. And that is when every male Jewish man, every Jewish Hebrew Israelite male is supposed to bring his first fruits. The very first grain that he cuts from his field in early summer, he's to bring to the Lord as an offering. And here, in the day of Pentecost, we see the first fruits of God's gathering, the first disciples to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God presenting his first fruits. And isn't it interesting that we call them the first fruits and the people that didn't understand mocked them and said, well, they're full of new wine. Well, where does wine come from? Hmm. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord, in one place. We also see that this is a fulfillment of Jesus himself, himself praying in John chapter 17. If you're taking notes, John chapter 17, Jesus prays to the Father and he asks him several times in that prayer, two specifically that I want to mention. He says to the Lord, he says to the Father, the Lord says to the Father, Father, I pray that they who believe in me, that they would be one, even as we are one. He prays to, prays to the Father again. Father, I pray that those who believe in me, that they would be one, that the world may know that you sent me. These were gathered together in one accord. When we see that one accord, it's this idea of an accord, that they are together in agreement of purpose and heart, that they're gathered together in unity. Church, this is the model we try to follow on Sunday morning, is that we want to gather together in unity about the Lord Jesus Christ, to obey his commands, to worship him, to praise him, to pray. Now, I don't know what they were doing. Many speculate they were praying. They probably were praying. They might have been singing songs. They might have been having, they might have been having bread and wine. Of course, Peter says it's only the third hour of the day, so probably no wine. But they were together with one accord. Whatever the details of that, I, I, whatever those details are of what exactly they were doing, I think is irrelevant. The idea that they were together in unity, that was important enough for Luke that he thought to himself, and that the spirit, I believe, inspired him, I need to write this down. They were with one accord in one place. I've heard it said before, listen, you want to see the spirit of God move, you need to be with God's people. Now, God will move and God will do some works with you as an individual. 
God will show some things to you. He'll show you fire and wind when you're by yourself on the mountain. That's what he did with Elijah. Elisha was on a mountain, right? He said there was a fire, there was an earthquake, there was a great wind. But what does the scripture says? The Lord wasn't in all of any of them. There came a still small voice that spoke to Elijah. God does this miracle of an earthquake, of a great wind, of fire. And then when he speaks to him, it's with a still small voice. He'll do that with a single man. The New Testament teaches us that Jesus says, where there are two or more gathered in my name, there am I. The New Testament teaches us of a unity of congregation, of gathering of people, not a separation of people to be all alone. Now you should, as an individual, as an individual should be devoted to the Lord. You should have privacy and intimacy with the Lord, just you and him, absolutely. But the work that he is doing, the work that he has called us to, it implies other people being involved. What is Jesus's new command? Love one another as I have loved you. It's awful hard to fulfill that command if there are not others. Love one another as I have loved you. That's his command. Paul says all the law is fulfilled in this command. Love, that you love one another. You fulfill all the law of God by loving. It's awful hard to love when you're all by yourself. You know, if you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with, right? <laughs> Listen, who are you with? Who's around you? Who's with you? Who's around you? Who has God placed in your life? Those are the people you're supposed to be loving. It doesn't mean he's not going to send more. It doesn't mean he's not, here's the thing. It doesn't mean he's not going to take the ones that you're with away. But when you are around others, namely the church, but anyone, when you are around others, your command is to love them. How do we love them? I know some of us, we like simple explanations. It's just easier for our minds and our faith to keep things simple. This is how I've simplified love in my life. It means for me, to love means to give and to serve. To give and to serve. And I get that because that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave his life and he served our needs. We were in need of a savior. We were in need of mercy. We needed someone to pay our debt because we could not afford it. It was too costly. He gave himself to us and he served us. Jesus himself says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. So to me, that's the definition of love, to give and to serve. They're with all with one accord in one place. I imagine if their hearts were unified, if they were in unity and they were loving one another, they're in one accord, that those who needed were given to. Those who needed to be served were served. That's what was happening. They had come together as a community to take care of one another, to abide and live with one another. Too many times I think we go into the scriptures and the world and the flesh teaches us to take the scriptures and we try to find little secrets and little mechanical things about the way God does stuff and say, oh, I know a secret here. This is what they did, then this is what God did, so now I have a magic formula. If I just do this, then this is what God will do. We try to hamstring God to bless us. Well, I'm doing what the disciples did, so you have to bless me. This is not a magic spell book. The Bible is not to be meant to be used as witchcraft so you could twist God's arm and make him bless you. You know, there are some... People don't say that's what they're doing, but the way we teach sometimes, the way that the church gets off of the rails is by teaching concepts. Well, if you just do what they did, you can have what they have. What if we looked at this story, saw what they did as an example of how we should live our lives? Not some secret to how I can get what I want. Mm-mm-mm. There are whole doctrines and teachings that have spawned from this passage of Scripture. Jesus told the disciples in the first chapter, you'll look in Acts chapter 1, just a few verses before this, Jesus says, Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. 
There are people that teach you have to tarry and then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. But that's not what Peter preaches when they ask him, what are we supposed to do? The people ask, what are we supposed to do? What does Peter say? Does he say, well, do what Jesus told us to do. Tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. That's not what Peter says. What does Peter say? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus instructed Peter to preach, was baptism and faith, that those who are baptized and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit as well. Mm -hmm. We as a people, this is a problem that I see a lot, and it's a problem I have, that's why I recognize it, is sometimes we worship the details instead of the deity. Well, they think if, if we do everything exactly the way they did it, then that is how God will bless us. They didn't play pianos in the early church. They didn't have guitars and drums. And I say, and? I don't walk around delivering cheese sandwiches with five stones in my pocket and a sling. God bless David. David killed a giant. That giant defied the Lord his God. Anybody here work with someone that doesn't love the Lord? So you think because David killed a giant, you should maybe go take a slingshot and hit that guy in the forehead with a rock? No. Why? Because we understand that the details of the story aren't going to be the same for us. The, the God is the same. The deity is the same. It's the same Lord God who is with David that is with you. But you don't have to do what David did. You need to do what the Lord commands you to do. Sometimes we worship the details of the story and we think, oh, we have to do exactly what they did. No, what they did, regardless of the details of how they did it, what they did that we should copy is they obeyed Jesus. He didn't tell you to stay in Jerusalem. He told Peter and the disciples to stay in Jerusalem. See, this happens a lot. People get confused. They think, well, the, all the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues. So this is what they teach. We should all speak in tongues. Is that what happens in this chapter? The scripture says 3,000 people are saved and baptized that day. Never mentions them speaking in tongues. So 120 and 3,000, the majority of them, no mention of tongues. Were they not filled with the Holy Spirit? Peter tells them, be baptized and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And there are people to this day that still teach, well, when you get filled with the Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. It does not say that in this passage. It's not telling you how to be filled with the Spirit. It's telling you what happened to the apostles. It's telling us, telling you and me, what God did with them. We don't want to confuse the specific details of their story with our own. And here's why I think that that's okay. Because some of us, we want something miraculous to happen. We want something big and huge and powerful to happen. Listen. The Lord God, Paul tells us, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Think about that. God is able to do abundantly above, exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. In other words, he can do more than you can imagine. Here, who here can imagine pretty big things? I can imagine pretty big things. God is able to do more than that. So why, if God is able to do more than I can imagine, why would I want him to repeat the same story in me? Don't you think God is a God that's big enough to do something unique with each individual? This is why I believe the last commandment is not to covet. Don't covet your neighbor's ox. Many of us here are like, I don't even have an ox. But there's probably somebody that's like, 
oh, I got this old scraggly ox, but my neighbor, he's got this beautiful ox. It's blue and gray, and it's hard not to covet that ox because I got this old scraggly one in my garage. Look, look at my neighbor's ox. It's so beautiful. I'm, I, I just, it's hard, Lord, for me to obey that command. I want to covet that ox. Why did I bring that up? God tells us not to covet what other people possess. Why? Don't you know that God has something for you that you can call your own? Don't want and desire what other people have because God has a unique, wonderful, amazing story and an experience that he wants to have with you in your life. You're probably not gonna walk on water like Peter did. You might. You might, like if God causes you to walk on water like Peter did, great but I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life sad because I don't, because that was for Peter. Peter didn't do cocaine. I know someone who did, and the Lord saved him from that. I have an experience that Peter didn't have with the Lord. You dig what I'm saying? God is so awesome and amazing that what he wants to do in writing your story is unique to you. That he wants to give you an experience. He wants to give you a life of abundant life and joy and happiness and peace that's just for you. Don't despise your own experience because it's not like somebody else's. And don't you dare force somebody else to believe, oh, well, if you don't have this gift or you don't have this miracle, you're not really saved. The devil is a liar. There are some people, I have people in my family, people I love that felt bad for so long because they didn't speak in tongues. They were around tongue talkers and they made them feel bad because they didn't speak in tongues. And I, I look at them and I say, God loves you. God loves you. Who cares if you speak in tongues or not? If you do, great. If you do, fine, have fun. But I'm not gonna get mad because I don't. I'm not gonna be upset. I'm not gonna be bitter and like, well, Lord, why can't I have that? Listen. He has something that's specifically for me. I want to talk to all of you that have never spoken in tongues or are against it. Let me just ask you this. Can you remember back when you weren't saved? The way you used to talk? Think about it. And then you got saved. You got filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you quit cursing? Did you start talking joy and blessing? Like, before you got saved, you kind of cursed. You said hateful, mean things. And then you got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And now you talk about blessing and, oh, praise the Lord. And how you doing, brother? And I'm going on in the Lord. And you're speaking a different tongue. You got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and your language changed. Yeah, you still speak English. But by some miracle, the scriptures say that the tongue, the tongue is an unruly thing. It can't be tamed. No man can tame the tongue. So how are you Christians all speaking blessing and happy things and joyful things and peaceful things? It sounds like someone changed your tongue. I'm telling you, there's something about these passages that we can learn from. It doesn't have to be exactly like they experienced it. God has changed the way you talk just by saving you. So you do share something in common with them. The Spirit has given you utterances of blessing and love. I used to have a filthy mouth. And I'm still tempted with it sometimes. But by a miracle of God, God has caused this mouth to preach his word. That's a miracle to me. That's a miracle to me. Because you should have heard what I used to sound like. It was horrible. So the fact that the Holy Spirit has changed the way that I talk, I read this passage and I'm like, oh, it's the same spirit. 
The same spirit that filled them filled me, changed my life. I don't have to be jealous of them. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Oh, believer, he lives in you. Don't be jealous of what they have. Don't want what they have. All you need to want is the Lord himself. Whew. Suddenly there came a sound. <laughs> Listen, I told you I might not get off that first verse. Let me just read this. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled the whole house where they were sitting. They did nothing to cause it. It wasn't their choice to do it. This is something God did. That's the thing that I get from this that I want to convey to the church. You cannot force the spirit to do anything. When God wants to move, he will do it. He's the one. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. In other words, they weren't expecting it because they weren't the ones doing it. It was the spirit. It was God himself that did it. And more and more, as we go, grow in our faith, we have to understand the difference between what we do and what God is doing. And folks, what I've found the longer I follow the Lord is that I have the lighter load. God is carrying the heavy weight in my life. God's doing the heavy lifting. You ever seen a really big dad sitting on a teeter-totter and their little child is up on the top and it's not moving? And dad's just kind of smiling. I've done this with my daughter before. I thought, this is not even. The weight distribution is not even. The glorious God who loves you, cares for you. He's doing most of the work, folks. He just wants us to love and be in unity together. He'll do the rest. I really believe that. I really believe that if we're loving, if we're giving and serving one another, giving to and serving one another, God's gonna do the miracles. God's gonna do the heavy stuff. That's not our responsibility. <sighs> then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each. Different translations translate this differently. It's the idea, uh, it could have the picture of one fire came in and then divided itself amongst them. The King James uses a different word. It says cloven tongues of fire. Now, I think this is more correct because of the words that are used in the Greek. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, so don't quote me on this. This is my opinion. The idea of cloven tongues of fire, of divided tongues, is the picture of flames that have two tongues on them. A tongue is that little part at the top of a flame. You know what I'm talking about? It kind of licks like a lizard's tongue. It's sitting there moving at the top of the flame. The idea of a cloven tongue is you think about cloven hooves of like a, a, an animal, like a deer. What are cloven hooves of a deer look like? There are two points. So imagine seeing a tongue of fire, but instead of just one little tongue, there's two on it. Now, if you're familiar with the Hebrew language, that's the Aleph. If you write the Aleph, the Alpha, A, in Hebrew, it looks like a bull's head. It's interesting that the children of Israel would make a golden calf. Where did they come up with that idea? So these flames, these flames come and rest on each one of them, and they have two tongues. It looks like the letter Alf, the A in Hebrew rests on all of them. And Jesus says these words in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Nowadays in this culture, there are a lot of people, they have, they have strong opinions about alpha males. Let me tell you what, Jesus was the original, original alpha male. He said so, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega, the first and the last. Jesus tells his disciples, I will be with you. He leaves them, he, dis he ascends in the flesh. His body ascends to heaven. His spirit comes. Paul calls it the spirit of Christ, that it is Christ's spirit that rested on the disciples. And Jesus fulfilled his promise, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will be with you. What does he say to the disciples? 
I will be with you even to the end of the world. This is the Spirit of Christ that appeared to them and rested on them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice, even the thing that they possibly were doing, the credit's given to the Spirit. They were all filled with the Spirit. Did they fill themselves with the Spirit? No. I mean, logically, we could, we could assume if they were filled with the Spirit, it wasn't them that did the filling. The Spirit filled them by his own choice. It was God's doing. And then it says they began to speak with other tongues. A person could go, aha, look, here's something that they did. And then it says, so Luke kiboshes that. He just crushes that. He's like, as the Spirit gave them utterance. They couldn't even speak with other tongues unless the Spirit gave them the utterance. These first four verses, they teach me that it is God's work. It is his work, not mine. He's the one doing the miracle, not me, not the disciples. God's the one doing it. It's God's mighty work. And and God forbid that we in any way try to teach some doctrine where we're somehow in control of this. We're not, folks. We are not in control. When God wants to pour out his spirit, he'll do as he pleases. And no man can stop him. Listen, I fought and struggled against the Lord God, and I was going to do my own thing. And he, he didn't just lightly rap and tap on my door. See, the scriptures say he knocks on the door waiting for you to open it. Listen, he kicked mine in. My experience was different than a little rap tap tapping on my door. He knocked it down with a sledgehammer and said, boy, you're going to straighten up whether you like it or not. And I'm like, oh, Lord, my life is yours. Please don't kill me. (laughs) Like, that's basically what happened to me. I don't know about you. Everybody's experience is different. But the Lord, when he came into my presence and I came into his presence, I feared for my life. And I said, Lord, I have no one but you. I have nothing but you. You can have all that I am. Please, show me mercy. I was scared when the Lord showed up in my life. I really believe this, church, that God wants to do a work in your life. And it's the details of what happened here. And it's probably not going to be the same for you. You know what's going to be the same? Is the Lord. He changes not. Sometimes he does things with a pattern so we can recognize that it's him. See, so what he does in your life, it might be similar. The pattern might be the same, but the details are going to be specific to you. I really believe that God wants to fill you with his spirit. Change the way you talk. It doesn't have to be some heavenly other language. He can change the way you talk. He can give you power. He can give you joy. He can give you peace that you might fulfill his great work. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I hope you believe it. I hope you believe it. This same God has changed my life, and I know he can change yours as well. He wants to love you. He wants you to draw closer to him, and I want to encourage each and every one of you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. The same God who did this mighty miracle is with us. He is with us. And we have cause to rejoice. We have cause to be happy, to be hopeful, to wake up every day knowing the Lord is walking with us and that he has a work that he's going to do. You don't have to worry about the work he's going to do. These disciples didn't do any of these miraculous things. All they did, they came together and loved one another. They were in one accord. They sought to be unified in love. In Jesus' name. That's what they sought to be. So church, we ought to be a church that seeks to love one another. To have unity. We're going to disagree on a whole lot of stuff. We all have all kinds of different experiences and things we're going through. There's going to be stuff we don't agree about. But we can, I think, agree on this. Jesus is the one. I mean, you came to a Christian church. I hope you agree with that. That Jesus Christ is the one. He's the one. He's the Lord. He's the one that we worship. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that saved us. Folks, I think that's enough. 
Like if we can come together in Christ's name, man, God can do, God can do the rest. God can do the miracles. God can do the work. Let's just come together in the love of Jesus' name to worship him. And let's see what God does. Amen? Amen. You ready to go? Let's go. Let's go. Stand with me for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity to teach from your word, to talk about your word. I pray, Lord, Lord, if I said anything that's not from you, Lord, or anything that was not helpful or joyful or peace-filled or truth-filled, Lord, I pray that that stuff will be forgotten and just show me mercy, Lord. Show this church mercy. Burn away all the stuff that doesn't matter. Help us hold on to the eternal truths of your word. Help us hold on to the eternal truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to have hope. I pray, Lord, that you would do a miracle in this place, that your miracle of unity and love would fill our hearts, that we would be compassionate towards one another, that we would be of one accord in this one place, Lord, ready, ready for you to do your strange, powerful move. Lord, if you want to send a mighty wind, if you want to send fire, so be it. Lord, I ask that no matter what you do, that you bring healing and salvation into this community. Bring healing and the salvation into this community. Many of us here have family members and friends, co-workers that we want to see get saved. Fill us with your spirit and give us the courage to go to them with love and share the gospel that they might believe and be saved. Make us a praying church. Make us a people that believe in your power and that we seek after your face always so we can watch you work. I thank you for bringing us into your church. I thank you for bringing us together. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.